So please give a forceful welcome to Supervising Director Dave Filoni and voice actors Tia Sakar and Sam Witwer. Thanks, Mark. So here you are. It's great to have you here. Yeah, it's great here. It's, it's always the fear before any panel. I'm sure they agree that mm. you always think one day it would come out here and be empty. But thank you guys for coming. I know there's so much to do. So thank you for coming to spend some time with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank um, you. We all love it. I mean, uh, you know, Rebels obviously judging by this is a hugely popular series. So congratulations yes, on that. How does it feel? I mean, it's, it's just so fantastic the work that you all do. But to come here and actually see the kind of the people that, that enjoy it and meet them face to face. It's, it's one thing working in office on the series, but then coming here, it's great, isn't it? It feels pretty great, because <laughs> we get to interact with you on, you know, on social media and things, but to get to actually meet you in person is so uh, gratifying and exciting and fun. So hello, thank you for being here. <laughs> So Dave, um, yeah. the question on all of our lips is, did Ahsoka survive the battle with Vader? Right out the gate. All right, so we'll get this one out of the way. Um, you know, <laughs> I always think I have it and then look, Yoda says a lot of things to Anakin. You know, death is a natural part of life. Miss people do not, mourn them do not. Uh, the conflict with Vader and Ahsoka is something that we have prepared for almost a decade. And it was something I discussed with George Lucas over different periods of time. And then finally, what's amazing to me is we actually got to do it. And that's something that when I'm sure you know, creating series and characters that you're never actually sure when you have long-term plans for a story arc, what you'll actually get to tell. And when Clone Wars ended, I was worried that, like, well, I guess any hope of establishing that and making that happen was going to go away. So we had a great opportunity uh, when Rebels came about to actually tell that story. Uh, and we took our time, and I think we really did it right. And judging from the fan reaction, uh, I think they agree. And the only thing I've said is that um, most likely, when it's probably when it's a character I really like, and obviously I like Ahsoka, it's going to be hard to kill her off. Uh, if it was something like Vader, that would make sense, but I'm not going to say in what way, but it's likely that you might not have seen the last of the Sokotan. Want to say something to you? I'm just surprised that he went that far. I thought yes. he was going to like dangle something and not tell you. We will say that. nothing more. We've had some lovely expressions here. What way that would be, it could be a cheap out, like a flashback, you know what I mean? Or I could the put clip a show picture of a lunchbox, <laughs> you know, it'd be like, yeah, I mean, you know, they would hate that, so it probably won't <laughs> be that way, but... <laughs> So now looking ahead to, to season three, I understand that the, a couple of characters got some new looks. Yeah, they did, for sure. There's Kanan. Uh, you can see uh, Kanan there, and, and still blind from his encounter with Sam. Uh, and, you know, we've decided to kind of uh, move forward with that. There's a lot of uh, great samurai stories, uh, Zatoichi, about the blind swordsman, and, uh, you know, it was something that we had discussed earlier on in the series, what will happen to them as we go along the way, and Freddie, uh, who plays Kanan is a huge fan of samurai film, so he actually understood exactly what we were trying to do uh, with this kind of wounding of Kanan and what it means for his character, uh, giving him something to look at his life in a different way, literally, like change the way he's doing everything. And you'll see the implications for his character, uh, the way this changes, the way he looks at life, is going to be, I, I hope, compelling and make him a better Jedi in the long run. And what about, we've got new looks for Ezra as well. Ezra as well, got a haircut. It's one of those things, you know, he also has a bit more of an attitude. Teenager, you know, so the parents can relate to that. We have to be true to real life. Star Wars isn't working right if it's not reflecting real life. So you'll see a lot of metaphors as Ezra kind of advances as a teenager that he as well has changed. The season one, a lot of people didn't like his kind of uh, Aladdin hair. 
so then I get rid of it, and then everyone's like, why don't you cut his hair? And I just can't win that way. That'll you teach know. you to respond there, to the fact. Yeah, when the soap comes out, they're like, why don't you have a little girl who's a bad one? And they're <laughs> like, please don't say she's dead. And it's like, okay, I guess. So but who's directing the show, them or you? Definitely me, because I they probably tell you don't listen to them anyway. I try hard, though, but you shouldn't try, so that's my feeling, people. <laughs> Indeed, do or do not. There you are. The new, the new, is that, oh, they can't see that slide yet. Right, because the next one's on the right. You were yeah, worked on that backstage. But. <laughs> now, um, Tia, let me turn to you. You play Sabine, okay? Um, yeah. Now, can you tell us uh, about the character, how she grew through season two, and, and what's in store in season three, perhaps? Well, for one, I just want to say that I think Sabine looks totally awesome. <laughs> And I'm really excited about this new hairdo. Hopefully, whoever, if any of you have your Sabine, you know, outfit. <laughs> now you have the new hair to go find and make or whatever. Are you ever consulted in these looks at all? So actually, after season one, uh, Dave asked me, he said, we're going to change Sabine's look for season two. What would you like her hair to look like? And I was so flattered and um, like taken aback that he would have asked me my opinion. And I told him. And she that was, he did not take that to heart. Like he, it was totally different than what I asked for. But this is exactly what I asked for. Like so, it, it took a production. It takes a while. So you told me. It was like, me, yeah, like, that's a good idea. We're gonna do something else. In the but, future. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that that was ever gonna happen. And now, and here she is. That's exactly what I what I wanted. So thank you. I don't know if you did that for me, but. Maybe I planted the seeds way back when. Um, sorry. So, so through season two, we learn a few more things about her, but we still don't know everything, do we? There's more secrets. And we won't know everything in season three, but we get to know a lot more, which I've been so excited about to, you know, to get to record because we get to I get to interact with more Mandalorians. I may or may not be related to some of them. Okay, <laughs> it's really, I've never, I'm, I'm usually not right next to Dave when I get asked these questions. It's a lot more, I'm like getting, it's warm up here. Um, but I, yeah, so we get, we get to know Sabine a lot better and get to know a lot more about her past and she sort of has to then, gets to, has to face her past in a real way, a very tangible way and sort of sees people from her past Maybe related, maybe not, but uh, there are some altercations. I don't know how much I can say. I'm just going to keep saying until he cuts Fascinated. me off. I'm learning so much. <laughs> uh, and she has uh, some new gadgets. Oh. Yeah, that's oh, good. That's so good. That was a close, wow. that was a close one. The reflex was there, Sam. Oh, that was good. Yeah. yeah. Give her a little I'm effort and tell her she's doing good. Yeah. <laughs> Along with uh, Kane and Inez was uh, new looks, all our other favorite characters are still there, yeah? Yeah, Hera and Zeb had uh, small modifications to them. Hera, because she's a lot more part of the growing uh, Rebel Alliance, she has more of a military look, she uniform, she wears a rank badge down. It's just to show that she's really becoming a part of that formalized uh, rebellion. And then Zeb, we actually stripped him down a little bit. Some of the armor came off of Zeb, and I think it actually fits him more with a new hope look. For aliens, so we're trying to start to fuse uh, the looks of uh, you know our show, and actually now that we know a lot more internally of Lucasfilm about uh, Rogue One and the look of that film, we're doing some things to bring the kind of colorful world of Rebels in line with uh, what you see in the film there. So there's a lot of kind of nice synergy going on thanks to the efforts of Story Group and the production team on uh, Rogue One, uh, which I think is what we've always promised at Lucasfilm that type of continuity. That's really interesting. That's really great. Now, Sam, to turn to you, you voiced Maul for The Clone Wars, uh, uh, and you do now for Rebels. Um, in the film, the live-action films, we don't really find out too much about him as a character. Now, is he really half the man he used to be? <laughs> He's something like, I mean, I, I think even, he's, he's like a third of the man he used to be now in, in Rebels. We keep cutting down fractions on this poor guy. Um, but yeah, oh, look at that. That's interesting. That's cool. We got Ray Park up there. Um, the guy who I have, you know, I owe everything to. You've met Ray, of course, yeah? I did. In fact, I met Ray. 
Phantom Menace was coming out, and this guy, Ray Park, was in, at, in Skokie, Illinois, at a theater, uh, promoting it. And I saw a, a, an advanced screening, so I knew who he was, no one else did. So we were just walking by Ray Park, and I'm like, it's Darth Maul! And they're like, who's Darth Maul? And he was really, really kind, and, uh, and I, I stalked him for several years. Uh, That's so believable. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. No, no, I actually, and funny enough, I, I kept running into Ray before this all took place. I ran into fast food places, all these different places. I'm not even kidding you. Cons. Ran into him. Ran into him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In his house, stalker. in his bedroom, at night. Uh, it's weird. It's wow. so weird. What are you doing here, Ray? He's like, Sam, go home. It's late. Um, and it's only gotten worse for him since I started voicing the character, really. No, uh, yeah, it was just a... <laughs> It's been really cool. I mean, you know, it's the same process with Clone Wars. Like, they will come to me with an idea that just doesn't work. And as you know, the actors need to really make it we into something it. that oh, is worthy of the Star Wars yes. For you guys. We do it for you. That's, and, that's and we exactly do it for Dave. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so why do you enjoy playing this character, Sam? Oh, God. Well, the, the coolest thing, I think, the coolest thing that David David Filoni. David, can I call David you David? Now. David, take the hat off, David. <laughs> Looks good. You need to start a merchandising line. Do we, can we buy these hats? No. Nope. Oh. Go buy a loaf cat, though. Those are in the store. There's someone running around with a Dave Filoni cosplay. Yeah, is that person here? Is he here? Wow, that's cool. It's not that cool. <laughs> Only my wife thinks it's cool, and that means it's not cool. Why, is he better looking than you are? Probably. <laughs> it's, it's pretty awesome. It's great. Um, but the, are the small sin. Right, that guy? Um, the fun of this guy is every time he shows up, since Clone Wars, every episode we've had an opportunity to do something a little different with him. At first he's this crazy guy in a cave with spider legs. And then he becomes a little bit more the Phantom Menace Darth Maul. Then he starts becoming this, this kind of general tyrant character. And now, I don't know what he is now. He's something else now. What, what, what would you say he is? Maul is, is now coming to grips with kind of what his life is about, what it's been, what he thinks it means. And he's searching for a purpose. He's searching for some type of existence because he's kind of failed again and again. He was so close to having the power of the galaxy at his fingertips being second in command to everything, and he's fallen several times from that grace. So now he's a bit in between. He's still on the evil side of things. He'll never truly be good unless he can find the selfless resolution, which is highly doubtful. So that's kind of where we're at with him as we go on this uh, journey with him in season three. Uh, to see where it goes. Absolutely. And what's, what's sad about that is that, you know, he trained his whole life from a child to become this Sith apprentice, and then in Phantom Menace, he's reaching some power, and then he gets knocked down. Clone Wars, he builds up that power, and then he gets knocked down again. And so now he's on his way up yet again, and we're going to see what happens with He, he with just this. hasn't learned his lesson, has he? Basically. Yeah. So what's his relationship with Ezra? Because that's what we're going to sort of start to see develop. You'll be my apprentice. Yeah, that's um, what he thinks, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, thinks, uh, he thinks of Ezra as his apprentice, as a, as a kid who has a lot of potential, but is just a little bit misguided, and if he could just nudge Ezra a little bit toward a different path, that Ezra could, could achieve everything uh, that Maul has been trying to achieve, and that perhaps Maul could help him along that path, and maybe they together could be uh, a team. I mean, Maul... I think to a certain extent, is it fair to say that he's looking for a, a, a brother of some sort? He's kind of... Yeah, again, I think he's like, in Ezra, he sees the opportunity to have an apprentice, it's legacy, to pass on something that he knows as the Emperor taught him the dark side, and he wants to imbue that in this young boy and make a reflection of himself. It's, it, but it's done from a selfish motivation. He doesn't see that, but it is. So you're always with the Jedi and the Sith and the dark side and the light, dealing with opposites, and the Sith and the dark side is always self-interested, selfish, and the Jedi and the light are always uh, selfless. That's why when Obi-Wan says, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine, it's because Vader can't imagine a power that comes out of being selfless, and that's the root of that idea, and we're extending that in things we're doing in Rebels. 
That's fantastic. That's great. Well, we've got another exclusive clip now of more in action from season three. Do you want to set this up for us, Dave? Yeah, I mean, I think that's about it. Okay. Well, something we're doing with Paul is, again, expanding his character, showing you that he has, a, a lot of times, maybe not just a wielding lightsaber guy, but there's dimensions to his character. So let's see what we find out here. That, but the set that you saw there, that they were uh, acting out on the characters is actually something from Clone Wars. That was a set that we were going to use in season six or seven that continued Darth Maul's story. So that was for an upcoming episode in Clone Wars, and when the production team and I were going over how we could do these episodes of Rebels, I said, well, we had that old set, how far did we get with it? And we looked at it, and we said we could use it, so we tweaked it and painted it up to look like Star Wars Rebels. And so there you go, it's again a legacy continuing and connecting things. So Maul knew about that place and was there because he would have been there in Clone Wars and we continue. So there, some trivia. Well, that's quite, I mean, I love the way you talk about a digital set, like it's a, a, a physical set, you know. That's how I was taught to think about it by George. Everything that we discussed as I was brought up, you know, in filmmaking by him was the live action centric thinking because that's how he thinks. So he didn't know any other ways that our communication existed on that level. And you know, it really helps CG production, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, we've got another exciting exclusive here because we are the first people to enjoy the trailer for season three now as well. The trailer, right? We're right into it. You're spoiling huh? us. We might as well because <laughs> I like to show something and then talk about it a bit. Okay. Why not? We got you here, we got you guys here. So let's show this trailer and talk about it. And let's just let's just take a moment and let's just expand the universe a little bit, shall we? Yes. Here we go. Ahsoka! Battles leave scars. Some you can't see. I will never let my friends get hurt again. The Holocron. I'm afraid it's changing him. What if there are secrets we can learn from it that'll help us destroy the Sith? Ezra, the secrets in that thing almost destroyed you. There are Imperial cadets at the Sky Strike Academy who wish to defect to the Rebels. This is Ty SS25. You can call me Wedge. Welcome to the Rebellion. I still can't believe we're here to break this guy out of prison. My friends, my friends! Ha <laughs> ha! I give to you, Reclam Station. If we could steal a squadron's worth, they would be key to building a strike fleet. Let's go get them. Everybody ready? Yep. Let's go. One last glorious day in the Grand Army of the Republic. Flying stormtroopers? <laughs> Worse, Mandalorians who serve the Empire. You haven't forgotten our ways. That has earned my respect. So what's in it for you two? Bitches untold, that sort of thing. So we'll split the treasure. <laughs> split the treasure, oh that's a classic. Governor Price, these rebels have proven particularly stubborn. How do you intend to solve this problem? I need someone who sees a bigger picture. The Empire is getting better at anticipating our moves. I underestimated the Commander. The previous attacks were clumsy. But this one was swift. Precise. To defeat an enemy, you must know them. Not simply their battle tactics, but their history, philosophy, art. Grand Admiral Thrawn. Carabast. Embrace your destiny. Jedi am Sith, the light and the dark. I'm the one in the middle, the Bendu. Once a secret is known, it cannot be unknown. Your anger gives you strength. 
I will pull the rebels apart piece by piece. I must become more powerful. They'll be the architects of their own destruction. Ezra, turn away before it's too late! The key to destroying the Sith. Look, you couldn't have grown up a Saurus fan without encountering Thrawn. And here's the Empire. It was a significant part of most of our lives growing up. There was a dark time where there weren't new movies and we were looking for new material and all of a sudden there's a trilogy of books called Air the Empire. It blew our minds. Like, how could there be more? So, that was significant. Uh, and I have to say, you know, there, it was always on a lot of our minds when we started Rebels and we're in this time period. Uh, uh, head of story group Kiri Hart and I, we have a lot of uh, like-minded things that we would want to see in Star Wars and one of them was always... Uh, Woo! So, we tried to strategize on when it would be best to uh, bring him in and if you, uh, we go back one slide if we could, but um, it was important to do it right, to kind of build the series in the right way. And uh, a big part of that too is finding the right actor to play that part. And I have to say this was one of the most challenging uh, characters that we ever had to cast uh, in Grand Admiral Thrawn. And uh, we're really lucky we got Lars Mikkelsen to come in and play him. Uh, we have now, yeah, he's fantastic. Uh, we have two Mikkelsens now in the Star Wars universe, which is great. Because we've got, you know, Maz over in Rogue One, so that's kind of fantastic. And they can, I'm sure, have a great uh, Christmas talking about the Star Wars galaxy. <laughs> it's going to be tough to be a Mickelson and not be in the Star Wars franchise. But, uh, yeah, um, it's something we were, we were really glad we could do. And I think, uh, I hope the fans are going to like uh, what we're doing uh, with him along the way and uh, I know you guys wanted it uh, and uh, we wanted it too so there you go uh, Thrawn's back he is yeah, well, you can't do this without Tim you absolutely can't it's you know a character he created so it was important to us that you know, he <laughs> liked what we were doing. And you know, it's kind of stressful. We brought him in and we hadn't really told him what we were up to. And uh, you know, I made sure to sit down and talk with him about it and uh, the character things and uh, traits that he had. And you know, luckily he was really excited about what we were doing. So to have his support uh, meant a lot to me as a fan and I know it would mean a lot to everybody out there. Uh, without that, I just didn't, it's not gonna be authentic to me. So. Uh, and he's got, you know, a, a great thing has happened as well. He's going to have a new book come out uh, called Thrawn, and that's the cover out of it. And how exciting is that? So you're getting Thrawn in uh, different media all right away, and uh, I can't wait for that. So good day for a Star Wars fan. Uh, it'll be a day long remembered. Huh? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's so much stuff. It's a lot to so take in. Absolutely. Now, Tia, I noticed you watching the trailer there. You've got the best seat in the house on the floor there. We see Sabine in there. It's exciting, yeah? The whole thing's exciting. I, <laughs> I purposely did not watch uh, any of what we just saw because I wanted to watch it with you guys because it's so much better this way. It's not on my laptop. Um, but man, that trailer just blew my mind. Oh my gosh. I think I have goosebumps still. And here I have a jetpack. She does this Mandalorian research, she's like, um, Dave, uh, most of the Mandalorians seem to have jetpacks. When do I get a jetpack? I'm like, don't worry, those resource books lie to you. Don't worry about that. It's not important. No, they're really accurate, but you know. I have been, I have been wanting a jetpack since I uh, knew I was going to be playing a Mandalorian, and I finally get one, and it's very exciting. Yeah. Delighted for you. Thank you. Dreamers come true. That's lovely. That's lovely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, look at that. Wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a minute. That's not yours. It's not mine, but. It's not yours. 
I got it, and I'm not going to tell you how. I'll just have to watch it. Taylor wasn't happy about that. No, he was not. No, Ezra was like, what? Well, first he had, we had to tell him what it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, why did you do that? He's, He's going to hear about it. Social media, too. Uh, yeah, we like the dark saber. It belongs with uh, Mandalorians. It was a Mandalorian weapon a long, long, long time ago. Uh, oh, wait, so. wait, 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 but possession is nine-tenths of the law, man. <laughs> I suppose, so. yeah, but that show ended, and, you know, in between, you know, maybe in the buyout or whatever happened there, at Disney Lucasfilm, it went to someone took else. Took it for me, is that what you're saying? I don't know. I'll just say it. What's that? Took it for me. You can say it. No. That would be like pocket voice, Sam, and you know I don't do that. Okay. So, He's they nice just guy. got Thrawn. They're not getting that, too. <laughs> yeah. They got the blue guy. Yeah, when I said gadgets, I meant jetpack and darksaber, so... And maybe there's some other stuff that yeah, you don't know about that because you haven't seen French animation yet. Don't worry, you'll see it. It's cool. It'll be just like this moment. Don't worry. It'll be just like this thing you, when you were surprised. Wow, and I'm so amazing. It'll be just like that. But Here, later on. It's cool. Trust me. You should trust me. <laughs> now, there you are. I know yes. you are. There's going to be some new characters in season three. There are. I'm really One of them in particular, voiced by a very famous doctor. Doctor. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, the doctor. The doctor. The doctor. Uh, Tom Baker uh, was kind enough to come in and do a voice for us, which I'm super thrilled about. He is absolutely fantastic. He's got a great voice. Doesn't He's got an amazing yeah. voice. And uh, it's the second doctor we've had in the animated Star Wars universe. We had David Tennant. Um, Clone Wars, uh, fantastically, and now we have the fourth Doctor, Tom Baker, and when I wrote this character, he plays a big character named Bendu, you can see him there, he's a big, big old creature, you can hear him in the latter half of the trailer. Um, Bendu is kind of the middle way of the Force. Uh, he's not he's dark, he's not light, he's something else, he's a force of nature. And when, Tom, when I thought of the character and who would voice it, I was like, it's got to be Tom Baker, because Tom's going to get this weird quirky character that he is, and his instincts as an actor feed directly into the performance, and I needed his kind of, you know, he's just so unique in everything he does, and Tom is so full of life. You, you talk to him today, and he's just bigger than life as a presence, and he's so fantastic, so uh, we're so glad when we got him, and he's going to make a big difference uh, for the crew of Rebels, of course, and uh, so glad to have him. He's just a different type of force character creature than we've ever had before. And I think that's that's what is most compelling about him. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what the rest, what the rest of it means. I get on a roll and information oh, starts. And see, they're sneaky because they get really quiet. <laughs> like they want me to forget they're there. <laughs> and they're like David Warner and the film and they're just talking and he's going to give away the plot. And I'm like, it work. And then this thing happens and that character happens. And I'm like, you know, I can't do that, so sorry. Because, you know, stuff is going to happen later today with Rebels. Soon, actually, so that'll be... We haven't got long to wait. We haven't got long to wait. Okay, good. Thank you. How long have you known Tom Baker? How long have I known him? Yeah, just, just, just that long... Yeah, just as long as the production of the show. I mean, as a kid, you know, Doctor Who, of course, he's the Doctor in America that we know with the no, scarf. No. I mean, that's the whole ballgame. My wife loves Tom Baker. Yeah. Loves it. We had lunch together while we were here, and I, she pretty much just left with Tom Baker. That was it. He is, he's a charmer, and Tom charmed everyone in the room, wife included. We're gone. Was, I had some free time then, which is kind of nice, nice for me, and that's all I've heard. We're at a Star Wars convention. All these Star Wars things are happening. Great reveals. Rogue One, our show. My wife is like, but lunch with Tom Baker was so incredible. <laughs> Nothing Star Wars related, but I love it. I mean, it, it was uh, as much uh, for her as it was for me, because I knew it was significant to her uh, and, and that's the thing I mean fantasy stories sci-fi uh, characters of that nature they stay with us our whole lives and who would think that all these years later I'd uh, be in London talking to Tom Baker and having him work on a Star Wars show talking to you at a desk it's insane you're, and you're still in Star Wars we were talking about that just the other day you're still in it's wow I'm, I'm like a bad penny <laughs> Cropping up in Star Wars. We, so you haven't known Tom that long? No, Not really. No, How long have we known each other? We go back to Star Wars weekends in Florida, and that's got to be like... A long time. 2008, so like probably eight years. 
Right, so you've known me longer than Tom. Yes. How come he does a voice before This is I knew it was going there! Oh! You walked right into it. Oh! <laughs> Alright, here we go. You learn this about actors, people. <laughs> they are so clever. They're all sneaky. This is so. This is Anthony. I see Anthony. Uh, Anthony yeah. has. I've known him for years as well. I, I see him. He puts his arms out. David. Anthony walks me. He goes. You never put me in your show anymore. And he hugs me. He turns and gone. And he ghosted. He's out. And that was it. And I was like, all right. There's a subtle hint. <laughs> We've talked about it over the years. I would love. To to we get always you talk in there. about it. I it's mean, going to happen. Yeah, years it's ago. It's going to happen. Years ago, when we did Star Wars Weekend. Oh boy. I spent ages, and I, I cut a little, I think I took the trailer of Clone Wars, and I redubbed the whole thing with all the different voices. I must have done about 15 voices of this thing. But you and did I it so well, I couldn't tell us. I didn't know that was you. Tell, it was just me, all of it was me. I did 3PO, I did, I did the, the droids, I did everyone. Man, amazing. If you'd have told me that, I probably would have brought you on back then. Oh, that was too good. Try not to be that good, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know what, though? Do you do a do mall? Do you do a mall? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, what's well, your, hey, Sam. What sort of thing would he say? What's, what's, what does he say? Give me a bit of a line for more. Uh, like something like, I'm this is an audition to Okay, I'm I, trying I, to, just give me a line. I'm gonna we're trying to figure audition. something out. <laughs> you feel like you should go? Why? All right. Do you speak Mandalorian? I've got to say that. No, that's not. I've what got you to speak say. some Mandalorian. Or do I say, do you speak Mandalorian? No, I don't speak. Yeah, Mandalorian. say, do you speak Mandalorian? Do you I speak Mandalorian. Do with that. Well, in a mall voice. In a mall voice. What would a mall voice be? Yeah, for I you? need the Come microphone. On. I need to yeah. use the microphone. Give me, give me one of these ones so you can comment on my audition. Yeah, okay. So you want me to say, do you speak Mandalorian like Maul does? Yeah, I, well, I want you to see, uh, say very soon, my apprentice, very soon. And when you say it, I want you to say it like kind of, and, and, you know this guy, where he is a great Maul. So if you do it like that, something, a very dark and evil, but with a slight smile, you know. Oh, to, yeah, make your shirt feel tighter while you do it. All right, so. <laughs> Very soon, my apprentice. Very soon. Uh oh. Is Wicked showing up on the show? Yes! Oh my can gosh, I, you didn't know. Can I? Yeah. Yes, could you Sorry, can right. spoil that for Make you? Make yourself small, Sam. Okay. Yeah. Very small. Yeah. Primitive. Right. The voice small. has got to go small. I want you to do, you can do Yub, 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 and you can do, um... Chihuahua. Yeah, be Chihuahua. That was a little bit too... All right, here we go. Like a come on, though, like... <laughs> yep, yep. Yep, Chihuahua. Wow. Whoa. Let's make a deal. You want to switch? I'll switch. Alright. I'll give you that. Cool, man. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Now, I believe you're all going to be itching to ask some questions. Mark and Elliot are amongst you with microphones, so uh, can we get a question from our audience now? Yes. Right over here. With Mark first. Yes. Hello. Um, oh, hello. Hello. Oh, way out there. Thanks, Matt. Um, you've adapted. Strike Force Chantipole from the West End Games. Are you going to adapt any more of the old adventures from the games to episodes? Uh, That's a question. You know, he was actually just talking to me about that very uh, game play scenario earlier. West like, End Games, man. Right in the green room. Uh, not particularly that I know of. Wrong answer. <laughs> Not particularly that. No, I, I don't think so. But there are always elements. I think because, you know, I grew up with those games, you see a lot of things winding up in the series. Like a, the type of aircraft carrier that we brought in was from the games. And I do resource a lot of things from the EU that I knew as a kid and that Henry Gilroy knew. 
Steve Melching, you know, those guys are always fitting things in. So a lot of little details, uh, I would say like the name Shandy Pole is going to come from uh, probably Steve Melching, Gilroy too, because I'll bust them on it, but I think it's cool, so we use it. But you never know. Very cool. Um, who's got our next question? Uh, over, over here. here. Jay Allen, thank you. Hi, Hi I'm, I'm Francesca from Italy for Abbeyrai.com. I'd, I'd like, like to know if uh, the next video is about a day, baby. I saw that coming. Yeah, I saw that coming a mile away. Um, no, no, not likely. Not. I, look, you got Thrawn. Don't say, oh, you got that's so exciting. We got Thrawn. Remember we got Thrawn, yay? Yeah. A couple of things, you know, Sam asked me to make this clear, so I'm going to make this clear. You're going to put this on me. Or Sam, no, you'll be glad because you wanted me to say this. Fair enough. Which is the, and I might pronounce it wrong because every group I go to says it differently, but the Yasalamari um, creatures are not something that we brought in uh, to the show. So he won't have the force bubble creatures because when I actually, I had had a talk one point a long time ago in the Clone Wars production with George. And, we were discussing those creatures and we thought they were kind of an impossibility because they were part of the, a life, they were alive. And things that aren't, are alive aren't negated out of the force, so, uh, you know, at least as we understood it. So I decided not to actually carry that forward. You do see, though, in the clip, he has a statue of two kind of like salamander creatures that I put in his office. And I pulled them right over his shoulder for you guys, so there's like a, an essence of it. But that's just not something that I wanted to continue because it doesn't seem logical with what we had in the film. So there's little differences like that, but most of the time I try to keep things immensely consistent. So there oh, you go. That's actually, just a level of honesty. I'm happy with you guys there, like it or not. You decide. I know you'll tell me on many types of media. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, what have you got? Hi. Hi. Much. For Ahsoka, will she, like, die and come back as a force ghost? Oh, wow, well, very direct. direct. I, I've said it before, the young people are always very direct and have the most intense questions. Um, let's see, if she did, uh, she would have to be aware of, to some degree, the technique, consciousness, thought process that allows that to happen, to be maintain your consciousness after death and be within the Force. Currently, I do not believe she knows how to do that. Um, so probably that would say no, but whether we have to worry about that right now or not is kind of up in the air. So. That's exhausting, is it not? Like, needing to know and getting these kinds of answers is just like... Too yeah, non-answers, it's great to you. Imagine being in the recording room and he says this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, DJ Elliot, what are you yep. doing? Back in the back. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt from the Jedi News. Are you going to get any of the other Clone Wars voice actors back to Andrew Logan? <laughs> they want more and more and more. Yeah, yeah, they want a little Tron and they want a Daniel Logan. You know, that's a strange connection, but... I told you, um, I'm like, you give them Tron, they're going to want Daniel Logan. You shouldn't do this. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the correlation was clear to you, Sam. Oh, but Tron and Daniel Logan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you never know. Uh, it's interesting how part of you never know is no. But... <laughs> Um, no, I've actually tried pretty hard to bring a lot of the performance voice actors back, and I've figured out ways creatively to do it a lot of the time. Matt Lanter was able to bring back, um, you know, which I thought would be really hard since he played Anakin, but found a way to do it. Uh, so, you know, I never know. I, I, I love those guys. They all did such tremendous work for me. I owe them a lot, and it's fun for them just to come back and be a part of Star Wars. So it's, it's always a possibility. I don't think you should keep recycling all that, so you can bring in some new stuff. <laughs> what are you doing that for? There's loads more fish in the sea. Oh, <laughs> you make me feel so bad right now. <laughs> all right, who have we got next? Back in the back. Okay. Leech is on the left. My name is Bryce. Um, I'd like to know what is the name of the character who teaches Ezra through the Sith Holocaust. Uh, oh, are you a small, are you child age to answer that question? I think so. Yes. 
Yes, of course. Back there in the darkness, the boys in the darkness. Twelve. You're 12. It's always 12 and under, the most dangerous questions. Um, that's a great question. This is a horrible answer. I know who that is, and I'm not going to tell you. But isn't there some value in knowing I thought it through, that it's very clear that I sit, you know, the story people down in Lucasfilm and I give them this whole history and they're like, that's great, Dave. And that seems like it'll work. I'm like, okay, cool. So we know. <laughs> Find out one day. Cool. DJ Elliot. Hey, so now that I've got to make a new cane and costume, <laughs> uh, I was yeah. wondering. <laughs> I showed him this the other day, and he said, just wait till you see it. Um, the inspiration for the little eye marks, those look reminiscent of Rex's helmet. I was wondering, mm -hmm. should we find out anything about that? Do we see how that comes about, why that's chosen, or is that just an aesthetic choice? The, the mask he wears in season three was one of the most difficult designs, and Killian Plunkett and I went back and forth on it several times. It was so hard to get something that was appealing, that felt like it was from Star Wars, uh, you know, it, nothing we were doing felt quite right to any of us. Originally, I had an adapted version of that mask you have on that I had Sabine cut up and, uh, yeah, modified to be a type of mask for him. So the root of that face shield that he has, I think, is still the ancient Jedi mask that he wore on Malachor. And then Sabine retools it so it's more comfortable for him to wear regularly. And then finally, one day, I just put the little eye marks on it. It serves two purposes. Outside the world, right, as a filmmaking device, it gives the audience a target for what he might possibly be looking at, which is really important for me to have some sense of eye direction and a feeling that you're connecting with the character. Inside the story world, for me, I think it's a nod to the fact that he and Rex had a troubled start, but now they're really good friends, and it's like he learned to see things a bit through Rex's eyes. Right here. Hi, my name is Minnie. Um, in the Clone Wars, there was the question between Maul and the Emperor, and I was thinking we would see more of that action between Maul and him. You, you really should do more scenes with Maul and the Emperor, I think, <laughs> because if the actor is available and, and willing. <laughs> Sam, do you do you play both? Maul oh, yeah, no, and I, the Emperor on Star Wars Rebels? I do, I do. I, that's a you good point. Do. So now I'm going to say with more certainty, you should definitely do that. Do you see why he's a Sith? Because it's a very self-serving type oh, of thing. Yeah. Remember oh, earlier oh, oh, I said oh, Sith are self-serving, not selfless. Do not do this is to selflessly, you know, wanting a question maybe, but not having one yet to answer, which is so selfless of you. And that's why I admire you on the light side of the force. What? Sure. What? Dark side, what? I'm just saying, I, I would rather Warwick not audition for the Emperor, because I, I only have a few parts left. <laughs> okay. Yeah, All right, so fair enough. Would, I, you know, it would be really dangerous, in all honesty, for Maul to run into the Emperor again. The Emperor kind of proved last time they made contact with each other that he doesn't have any interest in rekindling their relationship, so it might be dangerous for you, That's so that would be bad. Yes. Definitely. DJ Elliot. Yes, right here in the front row. Oh, cool. Hi, um, I was wondering if uh, you bring in Maz Kanata since she's 1,000 years old and we didn't really get to see her much in Force Awakens, so I was wondering if we've got to like, learn more about her. That's, that's a great idea. <laughs> You have a good mind for this sort of thing. That doesn't mean anything I've said means we're doing that. It's just sometimes I'll admit, if I had not thought of it, that it's still a good idea. I mean, it's an interesting point, Dave. As you watched The Force Awakens, were you yes. thinking, oh, I'd like that one? Oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> There's so much I would like. Yeah. You know, like, they had so many characters in every city, and I have so few. Because <laughs> we're a weekly TV show, my friend. But yeah, no, it's great. I, it's something that's fantastic. Like, now we're a production company making a film every year. There's so much creative talent coming into the studio, whether it be, you know, J.J. Abrams, Michael Arndt, Brian Johnson, Gareth Edwards, you know, and to meet these people and talk with them and to talk Star Wars is just invigorating as a creative. So it's something I'm really grateful for uh, that Kathy Kennedy is set up in this new era. It's, it's an exciting time to be at Luke's home. Fabulous. I think we've got time for just maybe one or two more questions, so let's get one from Mark first. Well, Jake? Um, whatever happened to Kath Bain? Kath Bain, the other blue guy with red eyes. <laughs> because for a while on April Fool's, I was going to put up a picture of Kath Bain and be like, ha ha, you thought it was Thrawn, and it's Kath Bain. But then I thought, no, then all the Bane fans will be mad and there'll be, you know, chaos in the streets. But um, whatever happens to Kevin? Kevin's really tough. Uh, he's really crafty, really clever. I, I would wager he might still be around. I don't know what kind of saloon you have to go in to find him, what kind of cantina. But uh, I, I wouldn't cross him, certainly, or, or, or take his name in a bad way. He might be out there. But in Rebels, I don't know. It, I don't like to keep bringing back all these characters that have talent that I, I know voicing them, it'd be great to make some new characters and perhaps cast some new people in those roles. I don't know why that striking is a good idea lately, but that, that might be a good idea. Good answer, good answer. Okay, one more question now, we're gonna go over to DJ Elliot. All right, I'm over, over here, far right. Oh, there you are. Hiya, uh, Kevin and Dan. I was just wondering, we saw on your trailer for Series 3 that looked fantastic, there was a ship that looked quite similar, similar to the Outrider. Uh, we're going to see Cash Break now. Right? See what I deal with? Do you see? <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Every little thing, Tia, every little thing. They, they don't even have the ability to frame and freeze it yet. They'll later go home and analyze and blow up. They took Fulcrum's voice in Season 1 and augmented it through a thing and tried to figure out who that was. Did anyone figure it out? I was prepared for them. But anyway. Uh, oh yeah. Oh my god, I would do it. I was a fan. I'm like, I would I would augment the voice and change it and figure out who did it. So anyway, see how I'm delaying from answering your question? This is a skill I've learned. Um deflecting, talking to Tia. Uh, I'll be direct with you, no. But the ship you've got and it's not, it's very similar, similar, similar ship. And something that's exciting is that it's like the same class of ship, if you will. Uh, Amy Beth Christian. YT 2400. There you go. Amy Beth Christian, who designed it for LucasArts, is now on my staff of Star Wars Rebels. So she got to recreate this ship that she designed long ago for LucasArts, which was an incredibly important moment for her. And I can't stress to you enough, how many people on my crew are longtime Star Wars fans, and it's just as deep and meaningful to them to get to bring these things back to life into the on screen uh, as it is for all of you. So, yes, it is exactly an Outrider class ship. No, I don't want you to be disappointed when the cockpit opens up and Dash Render is not there, but, you know. But Kyle Katarn will be in there. Right? No. Right? No, why would you I'm excited for Holt. Join me! Say that. Played by Warwick Davis. Indeed. Right? Oh, he's clever. He's oh, yeah. Clever. Gaming allies. This is it. This has been a fascinating panel. We've all had a ball, honestly. Uh, we've learned loads. I got myself a job. And <laughs> our interest for season three is peaked. So please put your hands together and thank Mr. Dave Filoni. Sam, I'm going to leave you to introduce that.